darkness seems to hide his face i rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil on christ the sun strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God,
Indeed, his name is the only one worthy of our praise today, and it's in his name that we'll find the strength that we need, that we can base our life upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us today. As we gather here, let us acknowledge his name and let us praise his name for who he is and for how he's worked within our life. Let's pray together as we prepare our hearts to continue this time of worship. Father, thank you for the privilege that's ours to gather here and through a relationship with your son be called your children. And we can call you Father. Thank you for how you've worked in our life. You've given us the ability to be here today. You placed that desire to be here because of who you are to us. And we come here in this place at this time and truly praise your name. As we come weak, let us find strength in your name. Let us also humble ourselves in your name, realizing that we are nothing without you. So Lord, work, I pray. Make us into who you want us to be. Refine our lives today. And let the praise that we bring be pleasing in your sight. Would you forgive us of our many sins? We pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. ask you to stand as we sing this new hymn the words God is speaking are we listening let's sing this together speak oh Lord as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word take your Holy 
great song to speak about the Word of God and let that be our prayer that God would speak through His Word to us at this time through James chapter 2. As we can continue to journey through the book of James, we have noticed many ways in which James has challenged us. Again, more than half of this book is direct commands, so to speak, from James. Uh, telling us what God expects from us. James, in his pastoral wisdom, the pastor's heart that we see coming through this, this letter to this church. And last week we began to look at James and how he called favoritism out and, and pointed that sin out in the church. And so think about he's told them to demonstrate a faith that takes care of those that can't take care of themselves, the orphans and the widows, but then he talks about what happens when these people come to church. And that's the favoritism that was forbidden. And then we come to probably one of the more familiar passages in James. When James carries on this idea of working out your faith, of producing works and fruit that come alongside your faith. Join with me, James chapter 2, starting in verse 14. James asks a question, what good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without deeds is dead. Several years ago, there was a cartoon of a conventional-looking church with a large billboard advertising its ministries. You may not can read that, but it's called the Light Church. 
And this is what it says. 24% fewer commitments. Home of the 7.5% tithe. 15-minute sermons. 45-minute worship services. We have only eight commandments. Your choice. And it ends up everything you've wanted in a church and less. Some of you are going, where's that church? 15-minute sermons? Wow, 45 minutes, we can beat the Methodists to lunch? If we're honest, though, to take out all humor from this, that's the experience that many in the church desire today. Let it be light. Don't ask a lot of me, and for sure don't hold me to the standards that we find in God's Word. Therefore, let me come in and go out real quickly. Let me not have a whole lot of commitments that I have to make. Don't expect a whole lot out of me. See, today we desire no quickening of the conscience, no feeding of the mind, no opening of the heart, no commitment. And that's what we would really prefer in the church experience. And I would say that what we want is no real faith. This was James's concern because it was just as likely then as it is today for church attenders to slide into a bogus faith that made no real difference in the way that they lived. And James wants to make it crystal clear what makes faith real faith. And in doing so, he sheds eternal wisdom on the relationship of faith and action. James' teaching, taken to heart, will steal the church against becoming a light church, will protect the church from reducing the commitments and reducing the standard that God has for each of us. Many have taken this passage and have been trapped up or tripped up by it because they look at this and they see James saying that faith without works is dead and they take the Apostle Paul's instructions that we have faith alone. It's by faith alone that we are saved. And they begin to go, well, James contradicts Paul. Which one is right? Which one is wrong? Neither are wrong. Both are right. As always, we have to know the context of why James wrote what he wrote and Paul wrote what he wrote. First of all, Paul would have wrote, had written that it's by faith alone that we are saved. As an evangelist, Paul was focused on the time before conversion. And he used his faith to mean the saving faith in Christ, the surrender of your life for, to Christ. And he used his works to perform or to speak of those acts that were performed legalistically to try to earn salvation. So Paul calls you not to follow the law to the letter legalistically like so many had, but instead to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And then a few years later, here comes along James. And James, as a pastor, was focused on after conversion. We would call that discipleship. Where faith was used to refer to some intellectual acceptance of certain truths without trust in Christ. And works was used to mean acts of ministry. So James is speaking of faith as the truths that you could claim and not have a relationship with Jesus. And, and, ministry, and works being ministry, the mercy, the love, and the justice that's done in obedience to God's commands by his indwelling spirit. See, both had opponents. Paul's opponents were the legalists who believed that you could act good enough to secure the favor of God and never place your faith in Jesus, so that you could act good enough and be assured of heaven. And so Paul fought against them and said, it's by faith alone that you're saved. James had opponents as well. And his opponents taught that moral conduct did not matter because they mistakenly imagined that inward faith was all that mattered. And that's why James would say, that our faith leads to works. These two great heroes of the faith are not in opposition to each other. Instead, they are supporting one another that faith makes a difference in our lives. Faith makes a difference in how we live. It's kind of like the railroad tracks. If we could go stand out on a, a clear horizon and look at the railroad tracks 
and stand here, you would know the distance, whatever that distance is. And that is the same from here to the end of the track. But as you look down the horizon, it becomes, it look like those, those tracks come together, doesn't it? And what we have between works and faith is that as we stand there, we know that it's by faith alone that we are saved and that our faith then leads to works. And those things never come together, never can you work hard enough to earn the favor of God. But instead, the longer that we live, the closer those things become and that our faith leads to greater works. That's what James is teaching in this passage. So what does that mean to us? I want to make three observations from this passage that I believe we need to understand today. And the first one is that real faith requires compassion and action. That James begins to speak in verse 14, pointing out that its works are the only acceptable demonstrations of your claim to faith. It's not intellectual statements. It's not sitting around and arguing about the deep truths about Jesus. Instead, and only is it works or the only acceptable demonstration of your claim to faith. What good is it, my brothers, if someone has faith, claims to have faith, but has no deeds? James contends that invisible faith must have visible evidence. Real faith cannot be held in the hand. Instead, saving faith results in actions of the hand. James gives the illustration of being at church or being somewhere else, and someone comes in who is inadequately clad. Perhaps they're wearing rags. Perhaps they do not have an outer garment on at all. And this person is so destitute that they do not even have food to eat that day. And there you sit, full and fashionable, fully clothed, stomach full, and you see the tattered individual, and this probability, speaking of a believer, you see that person and you smile and you look at them and say, Well, I wish you well. Keep warm and well fed, and yet you don't have the slightest twinge of conscience. And you go merrily on your way. Here's how we would say this in the South today. Someone comes in who is unkept, that is hungry, that's dressed in rags and riches, who maybe hasn't bathed in quite a while. They haven't combed their hair in even longer. And we look at them and go, bless your heart. I'm so sorry that you are where you are, bless you. And then we turn without any work of the conscience that we should do something about what we encountered. If and when this happens, James wants us to understand that there is something radically wrong with your faith. It is dead, James says. It is totally useless. It is totally lifeless. Wow, James, that's pretty tough. James is not the only one. John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Real faith requires compassion and action, that we must act out the reality of our faith. The story is told of an English preacher who came across a, a man whose horse had been accidentally killed. Obviously, this was back in the time when that was his transportation. That was his everything. And there was a crowd of onlookers who had gathered around the accident scene. They're expressing words of sympathy. When the preacher stepped forward and said to the loudest sympathizer among them, the one who was loudly saying how sorry he was, the preacher, again, remember in England, says, I am sorry, five pounds. How sorry are you? And then he began to pass his hat around and asking people just how sorry they were. 
See, we can say all day long, I'm so sorry you're going through that. But real faith requires compassion and action. If we tend to talk about our faith in the Lord and trust in His Word, but we do nothing or we do very little, you need to understand today that you may be in spiritual trouble. If we refuse to get our hands dirty or if we're cheap and we're grudging with other people, we must take inventory of our souls. Profession requires action or it is not real. James is clear about Real faith requires compassion and action. We can't just sit around, but we must get our hands dirty. We must see that individual like James describes who comes without clothes and daily food, and rather than just blessing them and sending them on their way, we get our hands dirty with that individual. And maybe today you don't see those in that way as much as you just see people that are hurting in general. And oftentimes we pass by. We see people, we see needs that are around us. We see needs within our church. We see ministries that need assistance, that need life, blood poured into those, that need your effort and your, en- your energy, and oftentimes we just keep walking by. What we must understand, secondly, I see here, is that faith and works authenticate each other. James says in verse 18, But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without out deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. James challenges the notion of I'm okay and you're okay. That you do your own thing and I'll do my own thing. He's basically coming and facing that head on, bringing up the scenario that someone will come and go, listen, you like to do stuff with your hands and you like to demonstrate your faith and you like to get involved, but I'm not that person. I am theological. I like to talk about the deep truths of our faith. I like to talk about my faith. And so I'm going to talk about it, and you go get your hands dirty, and you do stuff. We're both Christians. We just have a different emphasis in our life. And James challenges that thought. And he says that faith and works are inseparable. That we cannot just sit around and talk about the deep truths To put it this way, in today's church, we can't just sit around in Bible study. We can't just sit around taking in, trying to argue about things that don't make a difference. But instead, we are to be people who get our hands dirty. James is saying, you can continue to sit around and discuss those things. And to him, it's a sign that your faith is dead because you do not have works to authenticate your faith. Again, you say, wow, James, that's pretty tough. But James had a brother who agreed with him. His name was Jesus. And Jesus told a story about a parable of the sower where a a farmer was sowing seed, and some seed fell on hard ground, and some seed fell among the thorns, and some seed fell among the shallow ground or the shallow soil. And none of those were able to produce fruit. Obviously, the first seed fell on hard ground. That's the hard heart that oftentimes we can come before God and go, I want to sit around, I'm going to talk about my faith, but don't you expect anything to penetrate my heart. And so we don't allow the Word of God to germinate in our life that then produces fruit. Or we come with a shallow faith. And then we begin to understand that the Lord calls us to discipleship and calls us to forsake everything and to follow him and take up our cross daily. And we begin to think about that and go, you know what? I don't want that. And so that seed is burned up by the scorching heat. Or we really, we just can't sell out to him. We have the worries and the struggles of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and all this stuff that comes, all these weeds that begin to choke out the seed that's working in our life and it dies as well. Or we can be the seed that's sown on good soil. That Jesus says is the man who hears the word and understands it. I mean, he puts it into practice and he produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. That Jesus teaches us that true living faith produces fruit. 
It produces actions that authenticates our faith, that proves that it's real. And so today I would ask you, as you hear the word, and as most of you have said in Sunday school, and you're hearing the word now, where does that seed fall in your life? Is it on the hard heart that's not doing anything? Is it getting choked out because of all the things you've got going on in your life? Or are you afraid to really sell out and, and be a disciple, a true follower of the Lord? You understand the high demands that is that comes with that? And so therefore we just kind of back up and we never produce any fruit. We never produce any evidence that our faith is real. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, was speaking about true and false prophets. In Matthew 7, he says this, By your fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Speaking of judgment, thus by their fruit you will recognize them. And then he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Do we understand the priority Jesus placed upon works, upon demonstrating our faith, demonstrating the difference that he's made in our life. The people should look at us and not just hear about our faith out of our mouth, but they should look at us and see the works that we produce that prove that our faith is authentic. I don't watch a lot of reality TV. I really think it's ruined TV today. But when there's nothing else on, I'm scrolling through the channels, which happens pretty often, I will watch the show American Pickers. Some of you may watch that, where these two guys travel around wherever, and they make you, act like, make you want to think they just show up at these people's houses. How do you think the camera got there? You know? But these two guys show up at a house they've already set up. They find out that these people have treasures. Some of us would say junk. And they begin, they go to these places that many times they've just got multiple sheds or barns or just junk. Yeah, places of junk, you know. People built these nice buildings and put junk in it. And they begin to, to crawl over stuff and through stuff. And all of a sudden they hold up something. And they think they found a treasure. And then they ask, do you have any proof that this signature is real? Say it's a work of art. Or say it's just something that someone assigned. Do you really know this is real? How do you know? Well, every now and then they'll have something that has a, a certificate of authentication. And they can bring that and go right here is proof that this is legitimate. And that raises the value of what they have multiple times because you have something that people know is the real deal. When people look at our life, they often wonder, how do I know that's real? How do I know that this faith you speak of is real? And the certificate of authenticity that we carry is our works that they look and they see, you know what? When you saw someone in need, you met the need. When you didn't know how you were going to get through this difficulty you were facing, you continued in your faith, and I noticed that by your works. I saw the way that you work at work. I saw how that you do things without complaining, and that you were willing to go the extra mile, and I know that comes back to your faith. Or I see the way in which you treat your family. I see that you've been married to somebody for 40, 50 years. How did y'all stay? How did y'all come through all the tough times? Oh, it's through that faith that you speak of. See, as people look at our life, there ought to be some things that authenticate that our faith is real. And one of those is our service. That people ought to look at our life and go, wow, look at them. Look at the, the work that they do. 
within their church and within other organizations. Look at the difference that person's making. Why do they do that? Oh, it's their faith. And people ought to be able to look at us and see other things that authenticate our faith, a similarity that we have to Jesus. Got to look and see there's a growing closeness of us and him. The sympathy that we have toward godly things, the support of God's work authenticates our faith. Something as simple as the sweetness of our spirit The way that we act with other people authenticates our faith. It's hard for the person who's always a grouch to say they have a whole lot of faith, if any. The joy that we're supposed to produce ought to authenticate our faith. The steadfastness in our discipleship, the significant commitments that we've got, all of these things prove that our faith is real. Our faith and our works authenticate each other. In March of 2006, a 34-year-old engineer from Cleveland was climbing Mount Everest with a group of individuals. Climbing Mount Everest and coming back down, if you're a climber, I'm told, or a hiker is one of the, the summits that you want to experience. David Sharp reached the summit, but on his way back down, he ran out of oxygen. And he lay on the ground, dying, struggling for air, and 40 climbers passed by him. All 40 of them were so eager to get to the summit themselves that they would not take a chance on giving up their oxygen to someone else. And David Sharp froze to death. How often do we pass by the opportunities to authenticate our faith and show somebody that they can have the same because we're afraid to give someone what we have? That we pass by those people that while they may not be physically dying, they are spiritually dying. And we pass by them And refuse to demonstrate works. How often do we refuse to support the work of God that collectively as we reach out to one another to the ends of the earth through mission endeavors and we refuse to authenticate our faith by supporting that and we pass by a whole world that's dying and going to hell. You understand that you and I live in a state that over 75% of our residents will not go to church at all this year. That includes Easter and Christmas, by the way. And they're not even going to show up on Mother's Mother's Day to make Mama happy because Mama's not here either. Do we understand 75% of our population does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ and we just pass by them on our way to the summit? We pass by them as we say we're journeying to heaven, waiting for the Lord to take us home, but yet we're not proving that our faith is real. There's two illustrations that James gives us, opposite ends of the spectrum. He gives us Abraham, who we look at his faith all the way from the beginning, who was willing to leave his homeland and go to the land that God would show him, not even know where to go. You may know what that feels like, that God tells you to go and doesn't give you the road map. And Abraham takes off, and God begins to lead him toward the promised land with the promise also that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And then Abraham waits year after year after year of no child. But yet the Lord comes back to him and renews that promise with him. And he changes his name from Abram to Abraham at that time. And there we're told that he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. His faith was demonstrated by his works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. That son that he waited for for a hundred years finally came and God tells him to take his life. You see, he says in verse 22, that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And then gives the example of Rahab. 
the prostitute. We don't, we don't think of a prostitute in faith, do we? But God was working in Rahab's life. And as God was working, some spies showed up at her home needing a place to stay, and she welcomed them in. And she didn't know all the details, but she began to show faith. And she tells those spies, listen, I know that your God is the supreme God. We've heard the stories about how God has led you people to this promised land. We know that your God is the real deal, and I want to follow him. And the plan was laid out for her to continue to protect the identity of the spies. And she, in a very little bit of faith that she had, was willing to prove it through her works. And later on, we'll find Rahab's name in Hebrews chapter 11, that faith hall of fame, as a person of true faith. There's a third observation, and that is that there's a belief which is not true faith. And brothers and sisters, this ought to wake us up this morning. For verse 19, James says, You believe there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Do you understand that there's not a demon in the world that is an atheist? Let that set in. The demons know that God exists. They believe God exists. They know that God is the maker and that Jesus is his virgin-born son. They know the truth of Jesus' death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his coming return. But understand that it does them no good. James says that they shudder. Literally, they bristle up. You have here in this word that they shudder is the picture of a frightened cat that bristles up. Or a dog with the hair that's standing up on its neck. That these individuals, these demons, would say, yes, there is one God but they shudder, they're frightened at the thought. They do nothing to change their life as a result of it, but the acknowledgement of that brings them fear. And it teaches us there's a belief that is not true faith. That we can sit around and talk about theological truths, as James talks about these individuals, and yet not have true faith. For some of the greatest theologians of the world are not Christians. Do you understand that? Some of the greatest church historians who saw Jesus alive before and after resurrection never placed their faith in him. But yet they write about how that took place. And guys are sitting around exploring the deep truths of our faith and writing about that, and teaching others about them, yet have never surrendered their life. And it teaches us as these demons there is a belief that is not true faith. Simon is another one of those. Simon the sorcerer. His story is found in Acts chapter 8. Simon, we're told in Acts 8, 13, believed and was baptized. But several verses later, he makes an attempt to buy spiritual power. And after Peter finds out about that, Peter confronts him as he should have. And no surprise to us. And Peter says, you have no part and no share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord, for I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Simon did not respond. His quote-unquote faith here did not even benefit him as much as it does the demons, for at least they shudder. Simon did not respond at all. And Simon foreshadows those who week after week can say their creedal, I believe, but neither have faith nor fear of God. And tragically, hell hell will be full of people who are monotheistic, who believe in one God, who are Trinitarian, who believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they are lost because they never had true faith. And this scares me when I consider the modern day church. 
It scares me when I think of a lot of Christians that I know who would say they have a faith, a belief, but it does not lead to any change in their life. Those who would say they have faith, but they have no works to demonstrate their faith. Those who would say, I believe in God, which that's a common thing to do in our world. I believe in God, but I have nothing to bring to show you that it's real. I have no works, no support of the work of God. I don't have a steadfastness of spirit. I don't have the sweetness of spirit. I don't have any spiritual commitments. I have no works in which to demonstrate my faith. When Paul answered the Philippian jailer's cry, when they asked him, men, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus. The word in there means a motion towards something and to rest upon an object. And in this sense, it is the motion toward and to rest upon the object of Jesus Christ. This means to rest everything on him. That's where we come with the surrender. Believe in, to bring all of my love and rest it upon Jesus Christ. Well, then what about works? Jesus said the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. See, the lost heart thinks of works first as it desires salvation. What can I do to earn the favor of God? What can I do to make God love me? What can I do to appease the anger of God? Those are things that the lost heart thinks. But Jesus says the first work is to believe. And after that, a true faith works. And it 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 never stops working as we demonstrate that our faith is real through compassion and action. The giant hero of our faith, John Wesley, had this mixed up. Before John Wesley was a believer, John Wesley was already a clergyman and a missionary. He worked with everything that he had. Before he was a believer, John Wesley had memorized most of the Greek New Testament He had a very disciplined devotional life. He had a ministry to American Indians. And he often slept on the dirt to increase his merit where he believed that hopefully he would be accepted by God. But then came the day when he heard that it was by faith alone that you were saved. And he trusted in Christ alone for his salvation. He continued to preach in churches. And as I mentioned last week, he often was not allowed into churches because he wasn't with the elite of the time. So he began to preach in mines, in fields, in streets. Even on his father's tombstone, he preached. He preached over 42,000 sermons, averaging 4,500 miles a year. You may say that's not much. Well, it is on horseback. About 60 to 70 miles a day, preaching three sermons a day on average. And at the age of 83, he wrote this in his diary. I am a wonder to myself. I am never tired either with preaching, writing, or traveling. And as a result of John Wesley, the church has never been the same. Read about Wesley and his circuit riders, and you will find chronicled the most amazing love for Christ and a tenacious love for lost souls. But he had it all wrong to start with. He thought he could earn the favor of God, and he had a belief that wasn't a true faith. As he sat around and discussed the great truths of the faith, but it wasn't until he understood that it's by faith alone that you're saved that his life truly changed. We would all probably like the light church, like to have a light faith that maybe the standard wasn't so high, that so much wasn't expected out of us, But that's not what the Lord called us to. And anything that waters down commitment is an imitation. 
for real faith wholeheartedly follows the master and it works. And it continues to work until he calls us home. So today, my question to you is, do you have real faith? James says, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Can you say the same today? And you understand that if you have today a faith without works, a faith that doesn't lead you to action, investing in the ministries of God and the people of God, that James says your faith is dead. And Jesus teaches that your faith is dead. Today, would we do something about that and commit to having a real faith that by compassion and action is proven as we go. Would you bow with me? Heads bowed and eyes closed today. I, I want you to truly ponder the truth that there is a belief that's not a true faith. And Christian, if you can't look at a time in your life, an area in your life where you demonstrate your faith, that you're not involved in an area of ministry, you're not involved in proclaiming God's word through your actions that you need to consider truly today if you're saved. Are you like John Wesley, doing all the religious things, but refusing to surrender and to rest upon Jesus? Maybe you love to sit around and discuss the deep truths of the faith and Talk about those and try to explore more. There's nothing wrong with that except when that's what your faith is in. Because your faith should lead you to works. Father, today, search our hearts in regard to faith and works. And let us understand that a real faith is one that works. Lord, maybe there's someone here today for the first time and realize that they have a faith. Excuse me, they have a belief, but they don't have a faith. And today they need to give their life to you, to believe in you, to come to you, and to rest upon you. Father, there's times that we can forget about the responsibility to work. And I pray that you would stir our hearts to remind us of the need to demonstrate the reality of our faith. So I pray these truths will continue to dwell in our life. And as we prayed and sang earlier for you to speak, now we ask you to do that again. Speak to us and let us be obedient. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand together for a time of commitment, we're going to sing the song we sang earlier. And ask that you would be faithful in responding to God's word and his call upon your life. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape fashion us in your likeness that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith speak O Lord and fulfill in us all your purpose
Father, we uh, praise you this morning for being a God that leads by example uh, and working um, in your faith, Father. You were uh, willing to, to show a deed to send your son to come ransom himself for us. And Father, help us have a heart uh, as followers of yours that, would, that is willing to uh, live out our faith, to produce um, acts and deeds and love toward our common man uh, that we might be the tool that you use to reach them with the gospel father uh, just pray for our church that we will continue to be uh, a church that reaches out uh, beyond these walls father we just pray as we uh, take up the tithes and offerings this morning that you will lead uh, lead us to use them in a way that uh, is honoring to you and that spreads the gospel in our community father we just pray that you'd uh, bless our week as we uh, go to work and school and all the activities uh, that we'll be involved in we ask all this in jesus name amen Just when you 
Thank you, Robert, for that reminder. As always, it's an honor to worship with you. Hope you have a great rest of the day and a good week ahead of us. As we go, we have several opportunities in which we can serve and minister together. One of those, you, you'll find several things in your bulletin. One of those I want to point out to you is October 26, 27, 28 is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And the movie Indivisible is going to be shown here at our theater. Uh, this is made by or produced by the people who did War Room. It is another uh, marriage, family-oriented movie. And it's one of those things that we often say there's not enough of in our world today. And it's time for us to support that. And so uh, we worked to bring that here to town. We had to commit that over those three days that eight, excuse me, 500 people would watch the movie. And so we're doing pre-sales through here. We're encouraging you to uh, buy those for yourself and to buy those for someone who will not maybe come to church with you, but will go watch a movie with you. And they don't have to know what it's about. And as you take them, you're praying for the Lord to work in their life. Uh, praying to work in maybe their marriage. I just want to encourage you to be thinking about that person uh, and then get their tickets. They'll be out here in the foyer today. Uh, then next Sunday will be your last chance to get them. They'll be here before Sunday school uh, and after our worship service. Or you can stop by the office and get those. But uh, the times are, I believe, in your bulletin. If not, I can tell you those on the tickets. Uh, but it'll be shown twice Friday, I believe 5 and 7.15 or something. And then Saturday and Sunday, there'll be an afternoon and then an evening time. So I want to encourage you to get those tickets. Um, if maybe you want to buy some extras, uh, just say, hey, give these away. Uh, there's a focus upon uh, military and first responders. And so what we would do, if you want to stop by the office and, and pick up some extra and say, give these away, we will give those tickets away to those uh, who are... Uh, or serving in those areas and just let them pick what time they want to go so just kind of put that in the back of your mind as well also I want to encourage you next time next week at this time we'll be wrapping up and then uh, we will be having our quarterly business meeting well, our lunch will be provided for you and I just want to encourage you to stay uh, as one of the main items of business will be our 2019 budget and the proposal is uh, out here in the foyer if you didn't pick up one of those or some in the foyer of the education building but you can pick that up and then we will uh, answer any questions you may have next week or you can give me a call uh, or anyone on our finance team and they can, can help you out. Call Bill McGraw. He's the expert of that team. I mean, the leader of that team. And uh, he can answer any of those questions for you as well. Look forward to seeing you back this evening at 5 for a while and for small groups and for just seeing what God continues to do in our midst. Let's stand together as we sing to dismiss today. Our God says, our God says,